E aí, galera, tudo bem? Estamos aqui no DCS World. Hoje vamos fazer um vídeo do DCS FA18C Hornet de uma maneira diferente. Em vez de postarmos vídeos onde tentamos mostrar ou ensinar algo que já aprendemos e para os pilotos novatos, vamos tentar ir por uma área mais nostálgica. Vamos na área de história. Eu vou postar aqui uma sequência de vídeos que eu achei na internet sobre o nascimento do FA-18C Hornet. É o nosso FA-18C Hornet do DCS World. Vamos contar um pouco de história. A maior... Como os vídeos não são meus, vamos deixar na descrição, vamos deixar na descrição um link onde tem todos os vídeos originais para não termos nenhum problema de direitos autorais, né? Todos os vídeos eu vou editar, por isso vão ver bastante cortes, principalmente na área de som. Por isso vamos tentar contar aqui, ou melhor, vamos tentar mostrar aqui o nascimento do FA-18C Hornet, o nosso famoso e belíssimo avião de combate que temos no DCS World. Como estamos de férias, esse vídeo já estava programado. Espero que gostem e deixem bastante like, pessoal. Um pouco de história, uma história real do nascimento do nosso FA-18C Hornet, onde nós trabalhamos com ele aqui no DCS World. Valeu, obrigado e acompanha aí o vídeo. The soundness of the basic design can be seen in this spectacular spin testing of the prototype. It was probably not surprising, given the availability of such a proven and successful airframe as the high performance trainer, that its manufacturers were tempted to develop a dedicated single-seat fighter version, which became the F-5 Tiger. This aircraft's relatively low cost and high performance developed many foreign sales, although, like the Starfighter, it had not done particularly well in the US inventory. However, overall, the US and European markets for fighters had provided a windfall for Northrop. The company continued to develop the F-5 shape to provide even more maneuverability and in the process extended the area where the forward section of the wing joined the fuselage into a forward straight. The product of sophisticated fuselage development, the forward straight concept, together with some other T-38 legacies like the commitment to two light engines, was in the early 1970s to be incorporated in Northrop's next design, the F-17 Cobra. The Cobra was larger than the F-5 and offered many other advances, like the twin fin concept. But the model's lineage was still quite distinct, and Northrop hoped that the design, together with the company's proven experience with overseas clients and a wealth of knowledge gained in producing lightweight planes, would make it the winner in the fighter competition. The company canvassed the NATO Air Forces heavily with the prospect of buying this new aircraft. As you can see from this footage, pilot comfort and high tech came together in the plane's interior. Although in some ways it was still behind the F-16, in that its flight control at this stage was not fully committed to fly-by-wire. If Northrop could obtain a high proportion of the potential overseas sales of the new fighter, its factory in California would be able to retool after the end of F-5 production. Like General Dynamics, they hoped their plane would carry off the order for the crystallizing US Air Force requirement. In April 1974, the press, dignitaries and members of the military were brought together to see the YF-17. Much was at stake, but Northrop had good reason to be confident on that sunny Californian day when the plane was first unveiled for the public, 
that their aircraft would at least get substantial sales. The contracts were fast building up to be the biggest peacetime Western fighter deal of all time, because by now, both the estimates of NATO allies and the US Air Force had been revised upwards. As is often the way in US military procurement, the two US contenders would first have to compete, one alongside the other, in a vigorous fly-off competition, where the planes would be tested to their limits. When, at Edwards Air Force Base in California, Northrop and General Dynamics pitted the genius of each company's engineering teams against one another, the outcome was clearly going to be close. Both aircraft handled superbly, but at the end of the day, General Dynamics got the US Air Force contract with its Fighting Falcon. The one engine of the F-16, though a more expensive plant than the F-17s, had advantages of commonality, as the same engine was already in use in the F-15, and therefore, service skills and spare parts were already available. Long before the fly-off, General Dynamics had committed their company to production preparations in a massive gamble that they would actually win the day. This itself became a critical factor in the outcome, as it meant that they were able to promise delivery of their aircraft much earlier than their competitors. The Cobra had shown some shortcomings, in that its air brake, shown here, was thought to be less than fully effective, and there were some concerns about its range. There's no doubt that, coming from a long line of light fighters, the Northrop plane was a superb aircraft. But, with the economy of scale that General Dynamics would enjoy with their Air Force order, the Fighting Falcon scooped the pool for local and export markets as well. The F-17 was relegated to the pages of the history books, just one more design that didn't quite make it. The final card that General Dynamics had played to gain its European orders was offering NATO countries a large share of the aircraft's production for their local industries in a complicated offset deal. 
This meant that much of the technology that had been developed at General Dynamics Fort Worth plant found itself being used in Holland, Belgium and other European countries to produce identical aircraft thousands of miles apart. Paid off for McDonnell, who were now prosperous enough to acquire the giant, long-established Douglas Company. In the late 1970s, McDonnell Douglas turned its energies to serving the Navy's latest need. Mac Air had had some design and financial involvement in Northrop's F-17 project and thought the Cobra's potential was so great that they set out to isolate and eliminate the few significant bugs in the package. Provided in two versions, fighter and attack, it could well fulfill the Navy's requirements. The company took the F-17's basic layout and with their vast naval experience modified the design. For Navy use, it had to provide folded wings to be accommodated in the limited space of a carrier. More range, more powerful engines, and a totally upgraded state-of-the-art cockpit, which would sit in a completely redesigned front section, would be incorporated in the new aircraft. There were thousands of modifications. New forward sections and wings were to be built at McDonald's St. Louis plant but the manufacturing of the bulk of the fuselage and fin were to be at Northrop's Hawthorne factory on the jigs made to be used on the F-17 project had it gone ahead. Thus, two great aviation companies, interestingly enough, both relative latecomers, neither in existence much before World War II, came together in a combined effort to produce the aircraft. Here, a pilot enters the advanced flight simulator which will give accurate indications of the aircraft's performance in a variety of situations, even before the design is fully manufactured. You can see the improvements in the displays added to the basic F-17 cockpit in what is only a matter of a few years. The navalized F-17, retitled the F-18 and given the name Hornet, steadily progressed in development and the prototypes went into production. The latest materials were used to provide strength and lightness to increase the overall performance of the aircraft. Naval aviation requirements for planes that might be flying from an aircraft carrier anywhere in the world are very specific and components for the new type were individually subjected to thorough testing. Here, naval officers working with McDonnell engineers view a mock-up of the first F-18 Hornet. Made of wood rather than production materials, this model gives a good indication of what naval crews might expect of the real thing. As a bonus for the program, Mac Air had on hand the YF-17 prototypes. These were regularly flown, giving service and company pilots an opportunity to experience flight characteristics similar to, if less advanced than, those of the new aircraft, itself still yet to be put together on the St. Louis production line. One thing the Navy insisted on in the reborn Northrop design was a vastly more robust undercarriage to take the devastating effect of bringing tons of high-tech to a sudden stop on a moving carrier deck in a matter of feet. Here, the totally modified forward section, with McDonald's wings, both produced at St. Louis, are brought together in preparation for mating with the fuselage, manufactured in California and flown in on an Air Force freighter. 
Each section is completely assembled as a module or plane set. Although MacDonnell refined the plane so that the Navy would adopt it, clearly Northrop had played a major role in the aircraft's production. The similarity of the F-18 to the basic Cobra design leaves little doubt about how well thought out the F-17 actually was. Pipes, wires and joints from California are perfectly matched to their partners produced in Missouri, all coming together in a superb fighter aircraft that was to fill at least two Navy needs. The first of the 20 pre-production F-18s rolls out of the McDonnell Douglas production plant. Service representatives and other dignitaries mingle, examining the born-again fighter design, truly a phoenix from the ashes, that it is hoped will satisfy the needs of the Navy and the Marines, both in a fighter and attack versions. Taking to the air for the first time, the F-18 handled perfectly. Here, the heavily reinforced undergear a vastly more substantial component than that needed by its F-17 forebear is lowered. Before any fighter can go into service, the pre-production models are put to and beyond their limits. Each one of the 20 pre-production aircraft will be given a specific role in which to examine the ways of the Hornet. The manoeuvrability of some aircraft will be tested at high speed. Others will be dedicated to testing weapon carrying and release, and another to the difficult and demanding task of spin testing. In actual fact, the Hornet had excellent tendencies in the spin situation, and control was easily regained. The modern fighter pilot has the assistance of computer advice on a visual display to tell him what to do in disorienting situations.
Another of the initial 20 found itself in the hands of the Air Force, where, looking quite bedraggled and sorry for itself, it was subjected to bad weather conditions in an artificial environment. Extreme cold and extreme heat would be applied to the aircraft to check for the slightest flaw in the design. Back in naval hands, one of the test F-18s, all of which were identified by blue or red markings on the wingtips and nose section, was subjected to carrier landing and takeoff procedures on a land base. Landings similar to those which would be required on a carrier are experienced. The most dramatic phenomena can be seen in this test series. Catapult takeoffs and high angle of descent landings put the prototype F-18s through their paces. In heavy crosswinds, the computer-controlled surfaces struggle to keep tons of high-tech travelling in a straight line. On the 30th of October 1979, the first F-18 carrier landings were made, with Lieutenant Commander Dick Richards at the controls. Prototype number three was to be subjected to continual testing in a sea environment, with constant takeoffs and landings, touch and goes. Eventually, the ultimate challenge, carrier landing at night. The prototype F-18s were put through their paces and gave an insight into what the Navy could expect from its new economical high-performance fighter and, by inference, from the intended new attack aircraft. The combination of McDonald's clear understanding of naval requirements with the original genius behind Northrop's clever evolution of sophisticated lightweight fighters was clearly impressing the Navy as a potent answer to its problem. Interestingly, 
The excellence in the overall design was such that it never became necessary to make separate fighter and attack variants. The plane provided sufficient flexibility to accomplish both roles, negating the need to duplicate the aircraft in the all too limited space on board the aircraft carrier. By November 1980, the Navy was ready to take delivery of the first F-A-18. With the usual ceremony that accompanies such major events, the Hornet goes into commission. For the commanding officer of the first squadron to receive the F-A-18, Captain J.W. Partington, this is obviously an occasion of some considerable pride. This is one of the first two-seat versions to be produced, to be used for crew familiarization in the ways of handling what was fast becoming one of the most important aircraft in the Western defense. The Marine Corps' first plane was celebrated with equal occasion as this service took delivery of the aircraft that was going to replace its aging F-4 Phantoms.
Some of the squadrons now using McDonald's latest technology can trace their heritage back to a time when McDonald themselves were a mere producer of aircraft parts. It was likely that flying Levenecks would have as much success with their aircraft as they had with McDonald's legendary Phantom II. The Hornet is the result of an intensive design effort by the Navy, Marine Corps, and McDonnell Douglas. Hornet is a multi-mission strike fighter designed specifically to Navy and Marine Corps requirements. It is a fighter, and it is an attack aircraft for interdiction and close air support missions. Combining fighter and attack capabilities in one airframe, Hornet is replacing both the F-4 Phantom and the A-7 Corsair. The Hornet is the most thoroughly engineered and tested aircraft ever produced. Design concepts were confirmed with scale models in wind tunnel testing. These tests provided data to program the simulator. The McDonnell Douglas manned combat simulator has been used to develop Hornet's weapon system. During the design phase, test pilots used the simulator to analyze aircraft functions and aerodynamic characteristics. Throughout the design and mock-up stages, design features were reviewed by teams of Navy and Marine Corps aviators. Both military and McDonnell Douglas pilots have flown the Hornet prototype, the YF-17, gaining valuable hands-on flight experience. McDonnell Douglas began cutting metal for Hornet's forward fuselage and wings in 1977. In June 1978, the center and aft fuselage sections were delivered to St. Louis from Northrop. In late August, Hornet's 16,000-pound thrust General Electric F404 engines were installed. Distinguished guests, Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the McDonnell Aircraft Division of McDonnell Douglas Corporation and to the debut of America's newest fighter and attack aircraft, the F-18 A-18 Hornet. The rollout ceremony was attended by guests from the Navy, Marine Corps, and members of the design team. Now the F-18 multi-mission strike fighter will be capable of performing the total spectrum of air-to-air -air and air-to-ground missions, and that great flexibility will enable Marine commanders to employ the aircraft as the tactical situation demands. The F-18's emphasis on reliability, maintainability, will allow the Corps to achieve new levels of readiness and capability without requiring additional manpower costs. 
featured as the keynote speaker at the ceremony was the chief of naval operations, Admiral Thomas Hayward. And all here will be able to see from its lines that it's going to be a great airplane, a bird that will meet and probably exceed our highest expectations. The Hornet is certain to be a winner. Hornet made its first flight from St. Louis on the morning of November 18, 1978. need to stay on the tail of their adversary and lock on target. Down, snap. Defensive maneuvering requires severe G-turns and sudden escape moves. Right, right. I got sight. Knock it off, knock it off. In the last exercise, the trainee proves his mettle turning the tables and getting on his instructor's tail. <laughs> but he must still complete weeks of additional weapons training before he is certified to drop live ordnance. Among the F-A-18's most lethal air-to-air -air weapons is the Raytheon AMRAAM, or Advanced Medium Range Air-to-Air -air Missile. The AMRAM is capable of being launched at well beyond visual ranges in any weather, day or night. Its low smoke, high impulse rocket motor reduces the chance of enemy sighting and evasion, while its 45 pound warhead can take out any plane in existence. The AMRAM self-contained active radar seeker allows the F-A-18 pilot to maneuver immediately after launch without disrupting the missile's path to its target. Just as deadly as the AMRAAM is the AIM-9X Sidewinder. The Sidewinder's strength is for shorter ranges than the AMRAAM. Its tracking device features a 180-degree periscope-like infrared seeker that can spot and chase targets. The AIM-9X earned the name Sidewinder with its vectoring rocket motors, which allow right-angle turns. Pilots fire and sometimes even steer these weapons from the F-A-18's cockpit. What makes these weapon systems all the more lethal is a cockpit design with a heads-up display that allows the pilot to perform many functions without looking down. Code three, one, go. Code three, one, have a tanker down. And almost every task a pilot needs to perform can be done without having to take his hands off the controls. Well, the biggest thing to note is the uh, hands-on throttle and stick, or HOTES. I mean, everything you can do everything with just on, with your with your fingers. All they're on the stick and throttle. Where the Tomcat was more user intensive, had to push a lot of buttons, take your hands off the throttle or take your hands off the stick to do certain things. And in the front of the Tomcat, you had very limited capability as far as what kind of radar modes you were in and what kind of stuff you could do. Uh, the Hornet from the front, you basically can do everything. With the F-A-18's advanced cockpit design and fly-by-wire control system, the pilot has more flexibility than in any other Navy jet. What this aircraft becomes when you go airborne, or even prior to going airborne, it becomes more or less an extenuation of your actual body. I mean, you become a part of this jet, you become one with the jet. What these displays allow you to do is uh, find a, a mechanism or a conduit through which you can best glean all that information off, and you can incorporate that into your decision-making process while you're airborne. You get very comfortable hopping into this thing, starting it up, and, and launching off the front end of the carrier with it. To get this comfortable with their planes, future F-A-18 pilots spend over 50 hours in a flight simulator at NAS Lemoor. It recreates almost exactly the cockpit and flight characteristics of the F-A-18. 
This state-of-the-art equipment enables air crews to virtually fly every scenario. We'll initially start our training here with uh, just basic flight procedures, and as the training progresses, we'll learn different weapon systems, how to, how to fight the airplane air to air, and how to uh, use it air to ground. And uh, eventually, we'll end up flying at the boat with this. The final test that future Hornet pilots face in the simulator prepares them for one of the most difficult tasks in naval aviation, landing on the deck of an aircraft carrier. The minute you take off until, until you get on the carrier, that's all you're thinking about is, uh, is that landing. You can't replicate that. The simulator does the best you can, but there isn't the feeling of fear, the feeling of death, or the excitement, or the adrenaline. It doesn't come through your system in the simulator. But what this will do is give you muscle memory. When the adrenaline does start pumping through your body and, and the excitement, you start thinking about what you did in the simulator.
Good hits, good hits. D dash one, check six three, hit. Check six fours, hits. Okay, so I'll copy. Check six four, that is your target. Crusty, zero one, cleared hot. Good hits, good hits. Dash two, hit leads, hits. Crusty two, good hits, good hits. Shack, stand by. Crusty two, break left, flares, smoke in the air. Simulated. Missile defeated. Uh, we're taking effective fire from a, what appears to be a heavy machine gun, perhaps a dishka, and multiple AK-47. We're setting up a support by fire. I'm calling the 81 to get uh, to get a support by fire on this, but I need all fires, all fires from air uh, on the center portion of the puppy paw. In order, acknowledge, check, and crusty.